So uh, I'm not sure if everybody does this, but it's a good reminder that um, your lathe needs a little TLC from time to time. And there's a lot of things that you can do to just make uh, your time at the lathe a little more enjoyable. If you grab your, your banjo and you start moving it around, if, you, if it kind of sounds like sandpaper, well, good thing is it'll stick better if you need it to not move. But uh, I like mine to move nice and freely because I'll, I'm readjusting it to uh, meet the cutting that I want to do. So um, we, we got to clean up the banjo um, and underneath the, uh, the ways. Um, the tool rest itself, it's a good idea to do some maintenance on that, clean it up and wax it. And then something that probably doesn't get done to most, lays, to most of the lays is uh, we'll take the quill apart today and, and uh, show you how that kind of goes together. So first, um, we'll, do the, uh, we'll do the tool rest. That's the easiest. That's the thing that you should probably do the most frequent. Um, if you remember hearing of John Jordan, he would do this every time he would uh, go to work in his shop. And there's a couple things that you can do depending on uh, the, the current state of your tool rest. So the easiest thing, if you're not, if you're not turning, um, you know, big and heavy things and you don't get catches, your tool rest is going to be in better shape than somebody that's turning larger bowls. If they'll get an occasional catch. Another thing that's tough on your, on your, um, on your tool rest is if you have a tool, I'm trying to think where we got here. Can you get a close up of this? So this is this is an older um, uh, skew, and the, all the corners on it are sharp 90 degrees. And if you have that and you're using it on your on your tool rest, it's going to nick it up. So the um, the better skews, if you're buying a new one, on the lower edge, you'll have uh, chamfered corners. That, you know, and you can do that with uh, a little grinder, or sandpaper, you know, whatever. But you know, check your check your um, uh, your scrapers and like your skew are probably the biggest culprits for that, and they'll beat up your tool rest in a hurry. So going back, if if you um, are turning relatively, I'll I'll say tame, and you're not getting a lot of chatter when you do that, you're probably going to be just fine getting a block of wood and a sandpaper, and uh, just kind of going like this. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that yet because um, we're going to pretend this one is, I grabbed one that just had a couple more nicks. Um, we want to get these gouges out because it, it's real subtle, but if you're ever cutting, making a, um, a pass with one of your tools and you're trying to get that really nice smooth final cut, your gouge could stop in a nick that is almost one that you can almost not even see. And so you'll be going like this, and I've noticed it, where I'll, I want to just take that last light pass to get rid of the tear out, and all of a sudden I'm, my tool stops, and I'm going like, what happened? And then it's like, oh, boom, and there it is, a nick. So get yourself a file, and I think, I don't know what they call this, no, no bastard file. So this one has... Um, you know, I don't know, 30 degree angle, little teeth on it, and it's flat. The key thing is that it's flat. Um, make sure that you file your tool rest from one end to the other, because as you start to nick it, it's always going to be in the middle, and you'll end up with some type of a, uh, a curve on there. But, um, you know, just take some light passes and try to identify where the nicks are if you want. You could take like a Sharpie and you could go over your nicks. I don't know if you're going to be able to see that at all, but um, yeah, yep. So we can do, good point, Mark, just do the whole thing to make sure that we cover the whole tool rest. And then uh, even where it was already smooth, you'll, you'll be able to tell that you, you did clean that up as well. So, like I was saying, uh, John Jordan would do a little bit of this every time he'd have a turning session. 
And the more attention you spend on this, the less work it is. So it, if you do it, if you if you did it even just like once every five times you turned, you probably not you're not even taking anything off. Uh, this one is cast iron. Um, I think in that one it probably is cast iron on that delta. The robust, which we have over there, are some robust ones. They have a hardened steel rod uh, across the top, and uh, obviously that's gonna that's gonna be a little more work to do that. So basically, that's that's it from the good. Yeah, good point, Paul. Sure. So um, this top bead right here, if you look at it real closely, there's a weld line and there's a rod that's put on here. And like Paul said, it's harder, so it's not going to nick as easy, um, but you still get dirt. You might get some finish buildup. And uh, the other thing is just making it, it's, it's like having a clean floor. When I was a kid, it was always more fun playing in the kitchen after mom washed and waxed it than, than when before she did. <laughs> So like back on here. Oh, yeah, a flap wheel. That's a great, that would be a great tool for that. Yep. Yeah, Larry. Oh, okay. So, so in case you didn't hear for the uh, recording as well, um, Larry brought a robust tool rest back to uh, robust, and it was it had a nick on it. And what he did was he took the uh, tool rest on a belt sander. You said right, and then he rolled it on the belt sander, and the nick came out real quickly. Real quick, huh? Yeah, that's that's a good tip. Yeah, I was I was actually pretty impressed when I went to try to find one that was nicked, and they're all they're all in good shape, Jerry. Nice job. Yeah. So, anyways, I, I hit this with the file, and that'll keep it flat, and that'll help you uh, remove more stock, right? It'll remove it more quickly than sandpaper. But then after you do that, the file does leave uh, a little uh, rougher surface in, in sandpaper, and this is 220. That's probably a good reasonable grit and I would just do the same thing with the 220 and then you'll see all the little scratches on the tool rest that came from the file will disappear into um, long lineal scratches and again this is it even if you don't have nicks this is a good um, this is a good thing to do with your tool rest because as you make that last light cut it's going to improve your uh, your cutting immensely so just rub that off I'm trying to think if we can get you know so you can kind of see how that it glistens a little bit more and you can see a nice consistent uh, surface on there and then finally just get an old candle get some paraffin um, i just have some candles sitting in uh, next to my lathe and I just go like this and 
it's just amazing. That's all you got to do, and your uh, your tools will, will glide really nice, especially, like I said, when you're going to make those last couple of cuts. Uh, do the shaft with with the file or with with the sandpaper? Sure. Yeah, well, I, when you said do it, I didn't know do what. So um, it probably, you know, like if you had those straps, that would work really good with this. But um, it does get glazed over. You, you may end up with some nicks or, you know, a lot of the tool rests have a screw that's a set screw that locks it in place. And that might lead to some, you know, little dents and stuff. But, yep. Sure. And I think if you end up with scratches on the shaft, like from the sandpaper, I think that'll actually enhance how it how it holds in there too. So I'm gonna leave that off. All right. So now we got the tool rest. We're gonna. We're going to check the bottom of the banjo. So the, the banjo is obviously sliding on the, on the bed, on the ways. And uh, it's a good idea to, to keep those clean. I'll typically, I'll use either a, like an old 320, you know, when I'm done with a, uh, some sandpaper from turning a bowl. Uh, before, I always have a stack of it ready for the garbage. But I'll take that with a little bit of WD-40, and I'll keep my, my bed clean with that. That's, that's a good, cheap way to do it. But what you typically don't run into is uh, easy access to the surface underneath your banjo. Then that'll, that'll um, actually accumulate if you're doing, like, I spray shellac off and on to the, my products that are, if, if I have a small project on here, I'll, you know, put a little bit of sealer on there. And then you get a little bit of overspray. Well, the bed is easy to clean, but it might float over and get on the bottom of your banjo. So you got to clean that up. Um, typically, I've had pretty good results just with a rag or Scotch Brite um, and a little bit of mineral spirits. A lot of times, uh, it could be oil based. You know, take a little. Um, bit of the mineral spirits rubber on there and you might get the bulk of it off or it might loosen it up and then uh, and then we can clean it with a little bit of scotch bright kind of buff it out this will help it glide as you want to adjust it move it up next to your project now this is only this is like in my opinion I think this is half of the Half of the problem when your banjo doesn't slide is this surface. The other half of the prog problem is the shaft here. Or this, this is a cam. So in other words, as you rotate the handle, the shaft is off center. So it, you know, it, it moves up and down. But you have, uh, I don't even know what you would call this. What would you call this, this plate that yeah, so this uh, has to slide back and forth on here as you're moving your um, your banjo, and because it's cap, there's a captured like a like an eye bolt above this, so there's a hole through the bolt that you know is a, is a slightly larger diameter than the uh, diameter of the shaft, and that will maybe be stuck, and that won't be sliding. So I'll kind of do the same thing with this. I'll put some um, mineral oil on here. And then I wipe this whole shaft down. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sure, I'll, I'll do that one. And you can see already that this is getting a lot cleaner. And then what I like to do is uh, I'll just put a little drop on here, and then I, I like to I like to slide the the eye bolt over there because that's going to be a hard thing for you to get at is the inside of that eye bolt. And 
I'm actually getting quite a bit, quite a bit of uh, dirt off of here. Thank you, Lynn. Yes, it's mineral spirits. Thank you. It's not mineral oil. I did, I'm not putting this is a it's a cleaner, not a lubricant at this point. Thank you. All right, so that should go pretty good. Now, um, if you wanted at this point, you could lube it a little bit. Um, I wouldn't want to put grease on here, but WD-40 probably isn't a bad choice. It's a lighter, it's a lighter lubricant. A liquid graphite. So, and then, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Liquid graphite works good for um, keeping the friction that you need as well, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. All right, I'm going to put this down now for just a second. That's, that's basically done. And then another thing, and I, I'm thinking that there's quite a few people that maybe never did this to their lathe, um, and that's clean the bottoms of the waves. And that's another area that ha might have a lot of, it could have casting, um, little, um, I don't know, like burrs and things underneath here from when they machine the casting or the, or the casting itself. And it could also build up with pitch and... Uh, different things that you might be using. So what I've done with mine is I'll take a block of wood and a piece of sandpaper and then just kind of go back and forth on it. If it, uh, if it ends up, if you notice there's a lot there, you could lubricate it. Well, look at that. So um, where are we at here? Can you see that? So that was the way you know underneath there and so that's another potential uh, problem that you might have had in moving your tail stock or moving your banjo back and forth on your lathe and what's that yeah i think that's paint there's there's a lot of paint there yeah there's a lot of mustard well, a lot of mustard. why can't i find that oh <laughs> i haven't figured that out yet so but all right, so where did I put my, here it is. So, you know, take a couple minutes sometime and, and uh, clean that up as well. And I think you'll, you'll be really happy with how much better your, uh, your ladle will play with you. And, you know, in today's competitive environment, when you have all these manufacturers trying to get your money, when you go to upgrade, you want the next best lathe, and you're trying to you're trying to get the most for your money. You know they're not going to go back and clean this stuff up for you before they sell it to you. So there's there's that little bit of I'll call it rough manufacturing that uh, will will still be right from the factory yeah so oh yeah well when they're new and they don't want it to rust yeah they i don't know is that just a grease that they put up it's a grease okay and yeah so you got to spend more time cleaning the grease than putting your new lathe together <laughs> Okay, so, all righty. Thank you. That seems to be sliding pretty good. I didn't do anything to the bed yet, but the bed feels pretty good too. Okay, any questions? Any more tips or 
other other things you've noticed? I um I kind of got away from it. Um, I think I use probably WD-40 more than anything, just because you can spray it on. I can walk away, and it kind of evaporates a little bit too, doesn't it? I mean, if I come back, if I put a coat on it and I walk away and come back a couple of days later, it's like half as you know, most of it is evaporated or gone. And it, the WD-40, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I haven't noticed any issues like with my finishing and, you know, yeah. You know, if you use, um, I have I have this garage door lubricant. And it's, you know, looks the same, but it says garage door. And if you read the label, it's got silicone in it. And you don't want to get that on your wood if you're going to be, you know, putting lacquer and varnish and stuff on your projects because it'll make it uh, fish eye and, and different things like that. So, Oh. Yeah. I had some other stuff that I tried on my table saws and it was okay, but it was like, I, I didn't, yeah, like a bow, a bow shield, but there was a, there wasn't, yeah, there was another one too that was out there and there's, there's a half a dozen, but uh, the reality is, is if you use it, and you take, you know, take good care of it. Anything is good. Anything is better than nothing. And that, <clears throat> excuse me. And then, <laughs> builds up and gets sticky anyway. Yeah, so I I kind of I kind of do this WD forty after watching you with all eight of these and keeping them on, keeping them up and running. Yeah, yeah. Remember what the hell size was that? Okay, so the quill, we'll do the quill next. Oh, and, and by the way, you should do the same thing with your tailstock. Take it off and then clean that surface that's underneath there like we did on the banjo because, uh, you know, that's what it's riding on as you're sliding it back and forth. And you'll see spots underneath your tailstock that'll have, you know, like dark, I'll call it, you know, crud kind of built up on it. And it's a little bit of oil. It's a little bit of wax. It's a you know, a little bit of, of uh, shellac and maybe like a Tom Carlson, he'd even have a little bit of CA glue stuck on the bottom of his. With glitter, <laughs> yep. All right. So how many people have had their quill apart? Oh, wow, half? Yeah, nice. So, uh, No. <laughs> all right. So I think they're all just a little bit different, but they have the, uh, the same principles. Is that your hand wheel is tied to like a screw, a threaded rod. And then as you turn that, your, uh, the quill itself here is threaded inside. And there should be a keyway or some method to prevent the quill from rotating. So then as the screw inside rotates, this will go in and out. So it's kind of a simple concept. So um, the Powermatic has a set screw right in here and that goes through the, into the keyway. Um, here's a Delta. 
This is from this one over here. And that has the, uh, the lock and it serves a dual purpose of staying in that keyway to prevent the rotation. So if you potentially, well actually probably not on this one, but some brands, if you took this set screw all the way out, your quill may not work appropriately because it might spin with the uh, rotation of your handle. Does that make sense? And then Ed brought his tail stock in. This was a uh, shop box. And, <laughs> and he's got the same um, uh, design. And there's a keyway going on the, uh, on the quill. And as long as your set screw is like backed off one turn, it'll allow the quill to move without rotating. All right, so we're going to turn this out and out and out and out. Yeah, you got you have the new Powermatic and the threads are coarser, right? And it comes it Yeah. So I'm gonna do this. Yep, so kind of leave it right in its spot, but I, I just pulled this out and this isn't real bad, um, but you can definitely see that there's, you know, some grease and, grease and dirt that's stuck in here. And I was gonna bring my rubber gloves, my throwaway gloves and I forgot. So that is now out. <clears throat> so now the hand wheel, the Powermatic has two set screws and then the others I think have one. But um, basically turn those out. And this should come off. There we go. So this is a bear, not a bearing surface, but it's a, you know, a, a, a surface that uh, contacts um, part of the, the base here. And so that's something that we're going to want to clean out too. But you can tell uh, by looking at this that, you know, over the years, there's uh, lubricant and dirt that, that builds up on those. So this is the back end of the screw. Uh, you can probably just push it out any way you want. I just happen to have a doll sitting here. Ooh, that's, that's not... Uh, it didn't go that easy. <laughs> there we go. So they're telling me that there's probably like a little ring of, of goop inside of there. All right. So here's the, uh, the screw that's attached to the hand wheel. If you can see right here, this is like a washer that's turned on to the shaft itself. So that is fixed, um, I'm assuming. It, I think it was machined on there. So that's what prevents this screw from, you know, pulling out that way. And then the set screws lock the hand wheel to the other end. And it, it, this is the bearing surface right here. And, you know, that's the part that needs to be um, lubricated to make it turn easy. And then these threads right here are what engages with the quill. What's that? Yeah, give me, you can get another one ready. All right, so it cleans up pretty easy with uh, mineral spirits. And I probably would take a little more time if I wasn't doing the demo, but you know, get rid of the heavy stuff. Um, I like using toothbrushes. Yeah, well, shh, yeah, it's uh, my wife's toothbrush, but I, if you use, if you use plenty of mineral spirits, you can usually get it as clean as it was before you took it. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. In fact, I used to have the same brace that Brian's got because I didn't clean her toothbrush after I used it. <laughs> All right. So now I have the, uh, the bearing, I uh, call it a bearing end. The, and you can see there's a lot of contact with it because I'm sure when they made this, they, ox they used that black, that black oxidation probably on the whole thing. And that's all been worn off there. And then what I'll do here is uh, uh, I would normally spend a little more time cleaning these threads, but it is very putsy. So what I'm going to do instead is I'll get a nice little amount of mineral spirits on the threads and then use the, uh, the cloth to, to wipe that free and you'll get, you'll get the bulk of it. Okay, so I'm going to call that uh, clean for now. Take your quill and kind of do the same thing. Now I like using the toothbrush if it, if you can get in there. You might need a little bottle, like a you ever see the bottle brushes? If you can get a little one of those, if you're using a midi lathe or a mini lathe, the hole will be a little bit smaller. Um, we'll try to take apart Ed's here in a minute too, just to show you that how they're engineered slightly different. Okay, yep, I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> so we got a couple little tools here. I I gonna start using those on my Morse taper for cleaning that, but you can you can do the same thing. So on this end of the quill is the Morse taper. And we're, as long as we have it this far apart, we want to clean that. This happens to be a twenty gauge, twenty gauge, and it fits a little bit tighter. And uh, probably blowing all that dirt right down on the threads that I just cleaned. <laughs> the threads, the threads on here are like right here. They're about that wide. So it's not uh, in this particular one. It's not threaded all the way through. <clears throat> and then I'll clean this again just before we reinsert the uh, the cone center. Okay, so those are about ready. I think what I'll do is freshen this up a little bit. Again, there's a there's a surface on the wheel that's contacting part of the tail stock and it, take the opportunity to get that cleaned up. It'll go on easier more than any, you know, more than anything, it'll go on easier. And before we put it back together, there's a surface about, I don't know, maybe three inches right here that uh, holds the quill in place. And we're gonna wanna give that a quick cleaning. So something that I've done is I've taken, uh, you know, I've taken a dowel and I've cut a slot in it. And then, uh, thank you, Ed. And if you cut it wide enough, you should be able to. Put a rag in there. And, and actually in this case, an actual rag probably would work better than a paper towel because it's got, you know, it's it, it's got more uh, strength. It'll last along better. And then I just put that in here. And rotate. 
rotate it, and actually, I forgot to do this, your uh, your lock for your can stock, we'll pull that out. And I bet you I forgot it. So th there's a there's a brass uh, bushing that goes in there, and I'll show you how that locks that in a minute. Yep. Oh yeah. And so I just lost my paper towel. <laughs> <laughs> I brought lots of dolls. <laughs> so you could see, you know, I I didn't spend that much time on it, but it it obviously it had plenty of uh, residue in there to get rid of. Okay. All right. So now reassembly. Well, I should do this end too. I'll get that later. So this was the the surface that made it against the uh, the screw. Okay. Now you don't want to put too much grease on here, but grease actually is um, the preferred. Where did I put it? Here it is. So I just have a little, um, like a glue brush, and it, I just use it on my grease all the time. It's, I don't like putting too much grease on my parts, but I dropped this on a sharp object and it split on the side. So now I have a <laughs> an easy access. Yep. Right. All right. So I, I just painted on so that you can like almost not even see it. Right. Uh, yeah, this, I don't think it, I don't think it is. This is, uh, this is, I think outboard motor grease. And so I just have a thin coat in there. You know, I'll just take my brush and take some of that in there. You don't want to do much because you'll be cleaning it off later if you put in too much. And then I'll put a little bit on the threads as well. If it's uh, if it's really, you know, if you want to put a lot more on, you could you could run like a bead down the threads and then work it in and then when you uh, first the first time you use it it'll get spread on there the way you want it okay now what I found worked good for me is I would actually start putting this together and you know it's it's the left hand thread you know I've had the same problem turning I had it in reverse one time and I turned it on to make another cut and it just wouldn't cut and I tried. I, I even pushed. I even pushed till the wood broke. Yep. All right. So now it's looks like it's fully extended. And you can run that back in there. This is your friend now. But it's not always as easy as you think. <coughs> so get your... There we go. Ta-da, look at that. Okay. So I got a little bit of grease on there. I can put my, my wheel back on. And I would, you know, suggest that you'll see on this particular one, there's a flat spot. So you want to make sure one of your set screws goes back on the flat spot. Oops. <laughs> All 
All right. So so this is ready to this is ready to start moving again. Um, you could tell that it's turning differently. It was actually moving really good before. Um, oh, and you know what I did forget? I forgot to I forgot to uh, lube the inside of it, of this. So you can do the the same thing on here. I would say putting it on the uh, inside of the casting is probably a better idea. But this will this will do the same thing for now. And then we have to clean the quill because now we got grease on the outside of the quill. But All right, so then on the Powermatic, there's this, uh, there's the locking screw, right? And what happens is there's a flat spot cut on the side edge of this brass bushing kind of thing. And when you tighten it up, then you have this flat surface that's pushing down on the side of the quill, which will capture that and you know, obviously keep it from moving. And uh, I would just clean it up just a little bit before you put it back in. This one, and then mine at home too, there's a lot of uh, sawdust that fall, happens to fall in there. And I don't know how, because it doesn't look like there's a lot of opportunities. But you don't want this to be too caked up or it won't, it won't slide as, uh, as well as it should when you're trying to lock it. So when you drop it back in, the flat spot on here has to go back in line with the quill. And then we're all set. Okay, any questions? itself ah yeah yeah that's a good idea you haven't had a jam If you keep going, okay. Good. Should we do ads quick? Any? What's that? Well, we could move on. Uh, it's going to be the same thing. Uh, yeah, it's just going to. I don't want to dwell on it too much, but um, he's got one set screw going into his handle, and like I said before, the um, the lock is what actually maintains the uh, um, the alignment of your coil. So. Same, the same process. All right, what are we gonna do next? Tools. All right. Uh, what's that? Um, I did a chuck. We pulled the chuck apart. What was that two or three months ago? 
So, I mean, there's the you know there is different uh, different chucks, and they go to go together and apart as uh, kind of found out. So this is mine. Did you put that tool rest away? Thank you. What was that? Um, well, actually, I had to adjust my lock. So that might be something that you run into because, you know, like when you, you go and you, and you in your lock and your tail stock, your head stock in place if it moves. Um, I picked up that new lathe and I kept hitting the, the bed before I felt the head was locked in place. And so then I had to play with that a little bit. Yep, so um, it's that nut in the bottom. So it, <clears throat> it's basically that, in this case, it's the one on the next to the washer. Um, they're a little bit bigger, obviously, on the headstock, but you would just, you know, rotate that one way or another to get um, the position that you're trying to get to. That's, and, you know, um, I picked up uh, American Beauty, robust. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Clean the inside of what? Oh, okay. Yep. Sure. Yeah, that's that would be a good thing. Uh, the most of them now have that flat belt, right? The instead of just a V belt, and that'll uh, that'll fill up with sawdust and debris, and I, I you could take a toothbrush in there and clean that. Yeah. What's that? A clean toothbrush. Yeah, not the one that you just used to for on the threads. All right. Ah. Sure. Yep. <clears throat> another another thing to look at with your drives too is make sure that your, uh, you know, that you don't have. I don't know. There's a term for it, but it's like a little burr on your uh, Morse taper because sometimes that could prevent it from setting, you know, straight. It was okay. Just the point. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, we could talk about Morse tapers <clears throat> at a future meeting. That'd be another good one. All right, did you want to <clears throat> talk about tools? So, same thing with the lathe, right? Did you want the mic? Okay. How's that? Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, so we'd like to keep our tools just as clean as our lathe uh, and honed. Um, so obviously I brought in a dirty tool. I'm gonna take a little, reuse this, right? Just clean the pitch out of there, okay? Not a whole lot to do there. Um, this one's kind of beat up, so I would probably take a little bit of the sandpaper. Um, we keep this nice and straight here, so you want to keep the back of the tool just as clean, right? We're always rotating the tool, so the whole back side. Um, the hone. How many people hone their tools when you use it? Extends the sharpening. 13.5%. I do, but I don't do it often enough. I'll tell you that right now. Um, this just keeps that burr rolled over, especially like if you're doing a, a lot of sharpening, uh, depending on what you have for sharpening equipment. Um, the other thing is the 
scrapers. Scrapers work best when there is a burr, right? So again, scrapers dirty, clean the pitch off. Do a fresh sharpening on it, right? Now we have a nice sharp edge. And we just take this and we're gonna, whoop, actually I have this one. This is the one I use for my, and I just run this up. This is a diamond stone, so I don't know what grid it is. I think it's like 600. I know they make uh, burring tools, but this is what I had, so this is what I learned to use. Yeah. Yeah. So that puts a nice, now what you feel, the difference you feel, right, is a sharp edge, and this has a curled edge. So it gives you that better bite. Speaking of your um, scrapers, just another little plug. When, you're, when you buy a new scraper, um, typically they'll have the, uh, the machining right from the factory, right? And I think you can see it really well on this one. Um, back here, where I started to lap it, you can see the black is in the, the valleys of all of the, the grooves. Where, tell me when you can see it, right? You yeah. see all the scratching? So if you want to improve the scraper, and this would not be, um, not without uh, adding the You know, take your, uh, I, I have a set of three stones. Um, it's 300, 600, 1200. And it'll take you a while, but move up the, the stone and then start rubbing that out. And then work through until you get to that 1200 grip. Once you get all those scratches removed, and you go to sharpen your bevel, you will have a much better edge. And you get a lot better results. It's the same concept with chisels. It's the exact same con concept with wood chisels. So if you if you take the back of your wood chisel, not the bevel, but the back side, and you polish it perfectly flat, <coughs> you'll be able to cut through end grain very easily. And this will improve your scraper performance. And I put a, a negative rake on a few of mine, and there's a, you know it, it makes it easier in some respects, but I'm gonna when I when I grind them off, I'm not putting it back on. I'm just going to leave up the top because if you put the negative rake on it, then you have two different ground ground surfaces that you're trying to match up to get a sharp edge. Versus if you just polish the top, you're done. And then every time you sharpen the bevel on your scraper, you're going to have a much better edge, which is maintaining one edge. Does that make sense? Yeah, and and if you take this is negative rake right here, but if I didn't have a second bevel on here, this is a negative rake too, <laughs> right? So that's all you have to do, and uh, you'll be much pleased with uh, the performance on that. So speaking of the negative rake on the scraper, um, this has been on the board for quite a while. How many people have taken a class here? Wow, a lot more than I thought. I need to take a class, obviously. Does everybody know what ABC means? I'm talking too loud now, aren't I? I'm broadcasting, right? So what's A? Anchor. Well, I'm standing pretty still, so does that count? Anchor, right? We're going to put our tool on our tool rest. We're going to hold it in place. We're gonna follow the contour underneath here. That's why these are kind of radius. So you can put your hand right underneath there and hold it. I got my hand here, you can see. I didn't clean it up very well, did I? Okay, what's B? What does that mean? Where's the bevel? Where's the bevel? Right? The heel on the wood. The bevel, the bevel extends off the heel. 
So you're going to put the heel on the wood and you're going to rotate the tool into the cutting position, right? So you want to, you want to, it's hard to show without something here, but you're going to uh, overextend it. And then you're going to rotate the tool into the wood to get the cutting position, right? And then see, cut, you're going to make your movements, keeping the tool rest clean, keeping it um, filed down, sanded down, keeping the backs of your tools clean is all going to help you get a better, smoother cut. So that's the whole purpose of lathe maintenance, right? Keeping things moving the way they should to allow that tool to cut evenly and keep your, your product or whatever you're turning in the best position, right? So anybody got questions about that? Go ahead. Yeah. So again, what I said earlier, right? So I was doing some every slow down, right? Let's slow down. Make sure you're anchored. Make sure you're you're putting that bevel in, you're hitting that heel, and you're getting a nice smooth cut, and then roll through the cut. Right? We're using the tool. We're cutting with the tool. We're not you know, leaning into it and, and overextending and, and pushing the wood off the chuck or the spur drive that you're using. You're allowing the, 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 the edge of the tool to make the cut. So one of the things I wanted to bring in today and ask people or show people is how many people use carbide? So that's a lot more than I would expected. Um, I like my carbides. They have a, they have a place in my shop. I use them. I do a lot of resin work. So I do use them a lot on resin, but there are some times when I'll break one out for just my wood projects. Um, the bottom of the bowls, I like using a carbide. I, I tend to get a, a much smoother, straighter edge if I'm looking for a straight edge. Um, I made my own set of tools for carbides. This is just bar stock that I bought, I think, at Fleet Farm. And then uh, drilled a hole, kind of milled the head a little bit, and mounted the cutters. I buy the cutters online, so they're fairly cheap. I think I bought a box of 10 of them for 30 bucks. So that's pretty cheap. You can run um, a diamond hone, not on the bevel of the cutter, but on the top of the cutter. And that'll give you a, a fairly fresher edge. Um, my presentation is a little different than other people's with the cutter. Um, if I'm doing a finish cut, I'll leave it parallel and run a finish cut at center. If I'm doing a uh, removal cut where I'm removing wood and trying to shape it, I tend to run mine at a 45. Again, I'm at center with the wood, fairly parallel. The 45 tends to do more of a peeling cut to me than a scraping cut. Any big questions about that? Is that how everybody else does it, or am I the only one? Okay. You get gouge out in the wood? Okay. So it's this, it's the same principle as the ABCs we talked before, right? You can make sure you're anchored right. And the bevel on the carbide cutters is, is the, the angle of the, the cutter, right? You're not really running that bevel, right? You're using more of a scraper. So what, what you're trying to do is trying to cut smoothly without riding the bevel. 
So that's what that's the downfall of of carbides, right? You have no bevel to ride. So again, the important thing is make sure your tool rest is smooth. Make sure it's parallel with the work you're doing. You know, if you're running your tool list like this, there's the tendency to pull that same direction. Okay, I do you? So right. So the, the to me the round one is um, is the uh, I use the round ones to remove large chunks of large quantity of the wood. We're more of a roughing gouge exactly, and then the square one is to finish it up and square that off. That's right. so that sounds like what you, what you're 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 talking about. Um, what you have to remember is on a round one, you're only using a very small portion of the radius of the cutter. So. Um, if you're finding that you're getting too many catches or, or, or grabs or gouges, try decreasing the radius of your cutter. So that'll that'll eliminate some of the cutting egg, uh, uh, edge that you're actually able to use. So when I do hollowing, I have a hollowing cutter with a round cutter, and it's it's a tenth of the size of this. Just barely touching it. That's right. Are you going to say something, Kelly? Right. Yeah. Right. And I said the same as, and I meant the, the difference between the two is what I said. So I, I probably misspoke. And, it, and another thing, you know, since carbides are actually a scraper type of a cutter, right? I always try to match the radius of my scrapers to the radius of my cut. So if I have a big bowl and I'm doing, and I want to clean up that bottom, then uh, and I'm using, you know, I'm using this one with a real high arc, you know, or real, I should say, a, a larger radius on, on the edge there. And in, in that, would, you know, you just think about the curve that of the bowl, and if you have a small round cutter in there and you move that at all, it's gonna go in and out and you're gonna leave tool marks. Right? If you want to get rid of tool marks, it'd be ideal to have a scraper that follows the inside of the bowl exactly. Right? And that's you know. well and you know it's you all you have to do is you say say <laughs> honey, I need a new <laughs> scraper. I can't make you that big bowl unless I get a new big scraper. Mark? So what Mark's talking about is what the way this one's cut, right? So you can see there's a tight radius up at the top, and then it kind of drags off to the side. More of an ellipse. Yep. <laughs> I'm, I'm one scraper away from perfection. <laughs> but you can see, like, I have, I have a, you know, a couple more that are very small. And if I'm doing spindle work, I have one, I have a scraper that's got a radius on, on the end and it's only, you know, half an inch, maybe five eighths inch wide and it works really nice for just getting that last little hole on the spindle. And that's the other thing too is, um, this is a, again my opinion, but this particular scraper, it's a larger one, it's a nice chunk of steel. But it's a Benjamin Best. It doesn't cost us anywhere near some of the other ones. But I don't use the, the scraper to make a bowl. I just use it on the last couple of cuts. And I touch it up. So, you know, don't go spending the same amount on your scraper that you're going to on your favorite bowl gouge. Right? Mark? So you're not nicking your your uh, 
Nick and your your tool rest. Yep. These these edges here. Yeah. Yeah. So the bottom here, that's you know, I sanded those down so that it doesn't gouge. But anyway, if you're if you're going to use scrapers, get a lot of different sizes. If you're getting a lot of catches with that small scraper or your carbide. Are you at level? Are you cutting at level or are you, are you? Okay. Okay. A little bit of negative rake usually helps that. So would you get too far now you've, now you've changed to geometry. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And resin cuts differently than wood, right? You're not cutting fibers with resin. You're, 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 you're scraping plastic off of plastic. It is chatter. It is chatter. Right. So that's 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 your tool on the tool rest, and extending the the tool too far. And I'll be honest, right? I have never extended my tool too far over the tool rest. <laughs> but but if you look at if you look at the bend, right? And I don't. Yeah, sure. Yeah, <laughs> but. Even that little bit of bend that's in that, right? That's, I don't know. It changes the geometry, right? And every time I grab this to cut it, the first cut I go, oh, man. Oh, yeah, that's right. This is bent. <laughs> so then I pull it back, right? So I move my tool rest closer. I pull it back past this bend, and I'm looking at the tip, right? So now I'm not so much worried about having my handle parallel I'm worried about having the tip parallel and the smaller the smaller it's overhanging right the more the tool rest and the banjo is taking the pressure versus you trying to control the pressure bottom feeders what's a bottom feeder sturgeon okay I'll go with sturgeon so we take a traditional grind bull gouge right and we we take the heel off the bull gouge i don't know if we can see the heel secondary bevel exactly um l right you had to, you had your tool. Yeah, go ahead. You want the you want the microphone? Okay. So Al bought a bring it up, Al. Come on up. You want the microphone? <laughs> Thompson, Doug Thompson Tools. Brand new, right in the package. Even says on your bottom gauge. Right? So this is just a traditional grind. And I can't get it open. I knew I could do it. So this is just a traditional grind. Where are we? Bull gouge. Very square. No swept back wings. You don't want the wings to get caught, so get catches, right? It's a roughing gouge. So square. Um, but there is no relief cut on this. You see the back of this, right? So we are we are advising Al to go ahead and take just the area where the angles change, right? So you see the black and then silver. Take that area and just flatten that area, and, right? I would say that's probably sixty. I would say I would say sixty. 
That is correct. This is only for a bottom feeder. Right, you, that's what you bought it for, was the bottom of the bowl? So you're, you're removing the heel, so you're changing the bevel, right? You're still riding the bevel of the cut where you sharpened it. But the, the wood has an area behind the cut to relieve. That's where the, the fibers exit, right? You're coming off the top here, but on the back, you're, you're is dragging. Gets in the way, exactly. So we're going to see if we can show you here on this bowl. You want to, you want, a deeper bowls, right? You got your bottom feeder here, Tim. There's no way to get interrupted with the side with the side of the bowl, right? You start to to lose that edge. And also lose the bowl. Lose the fiber. Yes, good point. So you can't have that out. Yep. So if your bevel if your bevel doesn't have a relief on it, it it'll it'll actually bruise even more. But I'll take about half of my uh, bevel off normally. But you have the swept back grind on that too. So. More power.
16th, so I think um, up to three quarter inch uh, diameter, but they're scrapers. What it is, is these, and if you can even see it, and I can't, I don't have my glasses, there is just a little fine layer of hardened steel on top of these. So it's a mild steel shaft with a, with a laminated piece of steel on top. So it, don't take it to the grinder. It, it's, it, you'll burn this tool up in no time. Um, you wear, wear this back on the grinder very quickly. And actually, uh, Ed's got a, a lapping a fluid for his diamond hone. I just spit on mine. Uh, so, but I, <laughs> but no, I won't, I won't do it. I just sharpen mine by taking the, the uh, uh, hone and coming across the flat side. And then if you really want, you can use the, the uh, burnisher to roll a edge. And that was uh, Alan Lacer who came in with the carbide burnishers and had photographs of, you know, like 10,000 magnification of a, a ground uh, um, burr and a one that's done with the uh, carbide burnisher. And the carbide burnisher is much stronger and more uniform where, where it looked like a serrated knife kind of with the grinder burr compared to the one that was done with a burnisher. So it's, it's one way of, of getting a better, because in, in theory, once that burr is gone, you're supposed to redo it and, and not many people do. We, we use scrapers for a long time while they're actually dull. And uh, that tends to be why we get so much tear out when we're using a scraper to do a cutting. You know, when you're inside of a hollow piece, and you can't see it, doesn't matter much at all, but um, you'll get better performance out of them by doing that on, on once in a while, when I really get a round edge on there, I'll come out and try to follow the angle. But again, I don't take it to the grinder. I do it with a hone versus, um, but they'll last longer if you just take it off the top edge. So is that the same as like with a chisel? Could you put this on the, on the base? Sure. Yep. So you're just trying to polish the top. Right. You're making a nice sharp edge out there. Then you're going to take that burnisher and roll a burr on it. Well, it's supposedly stronger than one created from a grinder. So it's much, it's usually much stronger. You're, you're, you're flattening that edge and then you're rolling it back up with the burnisher. You can feel the difference already. In we're not really doing a whole lot here, right? But you can feel you can feel that edge where it came back. Yep. And again, I would. Yeah, this one actually is pretty sharp. You know, I'm not gonna. Yeah, see, I don't like that. I like it like that. Oh, you did it on the bevel. Yeah. Pulled it up. Edge. Yeah, it's too bad we didn't have a, any burnishers here. That uh, yeah, I I don't have a burnisher, so I use the backside of my stone. If you grab that stone, the backside is clear. Ah, okay. So I kind of use that. Yep. It, it's not really the and, same thing, but it's close. <laughs> oh, you were saying what did what did you have? You had uh, case hardened steel that you use. what we have on hand and we get used to using that and that's where we end up yeah. did anybody else bring in hand handle or tool what do you got Ha, ha, ha.
I was at that same demo. <laughs> Right, it's a bevel-supported cut, and and no, you you hone across the flat also with this one, and that was you never you supposedly never touch the bevel on these tools at all ever never touches the grinder. Is that is that angle right in the back there? The T that was there. It, it looks like it's been on the grinder. <laughs> Did have you? <laughs> because mine's polished. It's it's. From the factory, it's polished and it's very smooth. So, what do you use it for, Kelly? I don't. <laughs> it, it's one of those tools, you know. It's like use it a few times and it sits in it sits in the rack. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's it was it, they sold it as a alternative to a uh, spindle gouge. Yep. So it's a bevel supported cut and everything. So. What do you call that wide flat spindle gouge? Continental. Yep. And that's just that they were forged steel. They weren't made from a round bar. So it's it's heated and bent, and they got the flat tang rather than a round. So.